chess news number 36. Today I was supervising an exam on my school and uh, I was sitting behind uh, a computer and uh, so I was visiting chessbase.com and all of a sudden I noticed that um, the big guns are playing again in Sofia in Bulgaria. Somehow I lost track of the chess news over the past few days and um, well I quickly scanned a number of games it seems they have already played uh, almost half of the tournament and uh, I came across some very interesting uh, games and game fragments for instance in was it round one or two Magnus Carlsen managed to beat Topalov in a very interesting game maybe I will get round to that one also a little later on in the week but also I found the game between Vasily Ivanchuk and Alexei Zhirov very interesting. I'm not sure that uh, Ivanchuk would agree with me because it seems that some kind of accident happened to him in that game. So it is exactly that game I want to take a look at right now. So uh, let's get right over to the action. Ivanchuk played e4 and so this is the first round game and Shirov played c5 okay well we have Sicilian and normally Sicilians are bloody let's see what transpires knight f3 is the choice by Ivanchuk d6 and now bishop b5 now this move is considered to be a little bit less harmless than the open Sicilian with d2 d4 but of course black has to play uh, carefully um, in order to maintain the balance now they play theory for a lot of moves now bishop d7 is the normal move just blocking the check now the exchange on d7 and now c4 very interesting idea uh, white is trying to set up some kind of uh, a maroxi bind and he wants to continue with d2 d4 and uh, maybe if possible even d4 d5 claiming some space in the center and uh, also because of the fact that they exchanged the bishops of the white colors in this structure white may claim that he has the better bishop than black but of course uh, things are not so easy if at all uh, white will only have a very small uh, advantage so c4 uh, knight f6 was played, this attacks the e-pawn, so of course now knight c3 protects the e-pawn and uh, Shirov now also anticipates this uh, maroxi bind and prepares to fianchetto his bishop so that it will turn into some kind of a dragon bishop d4 is played, that's possible and c takes 4 is now kind of necessary I suppose just uh, to try and strengthen the grip on these black squares most notably this long diagonal where the bishop will appear knight d4 and bishop g7 okay f3 all this is uh, theory white is really building his maroxi bind here and now black castles now bishop e3 further strengthening the the black square in the center on d4 and knight c6 so for the moment uh, black black's play is aimed at the black squares and white is of course trying to hold on to these black squares and uh, he hopes to make use of the trump on d5 later maybe he can go there with his knight later okay castles was played and now rook ac8 was played this is uh, indirectly attacking the pawn here on c4 so it now makes sense that white protects that with b3 but there is a very small drawback to such a move. Of course, b2, b3 strengthens the c4 pawn, but it also weakens the knight on c3. And at the moment, the knight is completely unprotected. Now, black cannot make use of this, but later on in the game, we will see that it is, uh, or that it has become a very significant factor. Now, black plays a very uh, interesting move here, and um, 
to my mind it is a very counterintuitive move and I suppose uh, the big guys only play this move because they have really uh, researched the position very well and have concluded that it is possible indeed to play such a move. Now um, Black's normal strategy uh, to play against the Maroxi bind is just to try and tear down sorry to tear down either this c4 pawn or this e4 pawn and I usually tip uh, chess players that if they don't have a, a plan they should somehow try and protect um, the uh, units of the opponent that are closest to their own camp so in this case the most modest target uh, you could uh, choose would be c4 and e4 because both pawns are closest to black's camp and of course they also um, somehow uh, cramp black's position and they strengthen the hold over the d5 square here for white's pieces so if it were possible somehow to play b5 or d5 then black would be on the right track he would break down white center and then the territory behind the center uh, let's indicate these squares in red would become weak because um, yeah let's indicate a few more squares like this because uh, well the C pawn has gone forward and the E pawn has gone forward and of course we know pawns can't go back so pawns in this area and we will also see that in this game uh, these squares have become a little bit weak okay so that's uh, <laughs> well um, quite a comment here but black plays here e6 so all this comment just to uh, illuminate this move e6 here now what does it do of course we can see immediately that it weakens the d6 pawn and normally we're not inclined to play such a move but if white cannot make use of the fact that d6 is a weakness it asked if he cannot attack the weakness and win it in the long run hey then maybe black will be in time to play d65 resolve his weakness and then of course the move e6 um, will aid in the advance of the d pawn so all this has been figured out long ago and uh, this move is very much possible for black so they're still in their theory rook c1 was played now rook fd8 also preparing uh, the thrust d65 and now queen d2 you see white is even a little bit late in doubling here on the d file and now here it comes d5 um, well yeah I suppose that uh, white is left with a number of choices here knight takes c6 looks like a move c takes d5 looks like a move but the move that has been played most often here is e takes d5 and that's also what Ivanchuk does e takes d5 now of course she of recaptures here e takes d5 also and now probably the normal move would have been to play knight takes c6 and then after b takes c6 continue with uh, c takes d5 and uh, I suppose that after both knight takes d5 or c takes d5 for instance let's have a look at knight d5 and the subsequent knight d5 queen takes d5 and maybe even queen takes d5 c takes d5 rook takes c8 rook takes c8 bishop a7 rook a8 bishop c5 and rook a2 the position has become very very drawish maybe white is slightly better because he has the the queen side pawn which is further away from the kings the outside pass pawn as we say but i find it hard to believe that he would actually be able to win this position maybe with rook d1 threatening to win the pawn on d5 also making use of the fact that black's king is a little bit unsecure and that uh, white's king at least has a an escape square on f2 if the black rook were to check on the back rank 
However, that is not what Ivanchuk played in this position. Now, of course, Ivanchuk is a great, great player, and I'm sure that he maybe, if he couldn't calculate this variation, that maybe he knew of this variation, you know, where all the pieces get exchanged, and he was thinking, hmm, you know, maybe I should try something different. And he was looking at the position and looking at the position and said to himself, well, normally the right strategy would of course not be to exchange on d5, but to try and create a pawn majority on the queen side. And then if I can hold on to the blockading square on d4, I will stop his pawn on d5 and try to mobilize my own pawn majority on the queen side. Maybe that's where my winning chances will lay. So, that's what he does. He plays here c5, and as indicated, the right strategy, but under the given circumstances, it is a tactical mistake, which passes the advantage to black. And now, I ask you to pay very close attention, because sometimes chess is a very crude and very mechanical game. Um, you may even want to pause the video here just to see how Shirov now uh, seizes the advantage. It's not very easy but you know, just for you guys out there that want to invest some time into the position, see if they understand what's going on, I will count to five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we go back to the game. Shirov now plays knight takes d4 and this is of course a very forcing move because it takes a piece so really the choice that uh, Ivanchuk is left with is I, I suppose just two moves and uh, one of them queen takes d4 uh, fails to knight e4 that's not too difficult to see unleashing an attack on the queen and the knight so uh, white will lose more material so, after knight takes d4, Ivanchuk was forced to play bishop takes d4. Well, okay, so you think, and now what, black player, what's going on? I mean, I have my queenside majority, I'm still blocking the d4 uh, square, your pawn on d5 is going nowhere, maybe my next move will be... Um, you know, uh, b4, and I will come with a4, and b4, b5, etc, etc. Maybe I will also take over the e-file, or put this rook here, just to put some pressure against this pawn on d5 also. And, um, yeah, try to create winning chances, right? Uh, also, it's very nice, of course, that uh, this pawn is protecting the e4 square and the g4 square, so your knight can't jump to e4 or g4. Is it? No! It's not! Because after bishop takes d4, Ivanchuk had miscalculated the position. And it has to do with the fact that the position of most of his pieces are slightly uncoordinated. Because, and I'm sure he was shocked, Shirov put the board on fire here with knight e4. Now, <laughs> this is not a move that comes to mind easily, but if we pay close attention, we can understand the move. Of course, again, it unleashes the power of the bishop from g7 against the bishop on d4. Furthermore, it is again a very forcing move because the knight is attacking the queen. And also, we can see that behind the d5 pawn, there is this battery on d8 and on d7 hiding hiding in ambush because if the d5 pawn were to occur on e4 then all of a sudden the d file would be opened up and again the bishop on d4 and the queen on d2 would be in danger also from this battery now let's have a look at the most obvious move let's just take this knight and say hey what are you doing are you just blundering a piece well, I suppose Shirov would say, no, I'm not blundering a piece. I just opened the d-file and now I attack your pinned bishop on d4. Because note, 
dear Mr. Ivan Duke, that your queen on d2 is unprotected. So if you were to play something like bishop e3, I would just regain the piece on d2. And uh, in the process, I would have a rook on the second rank. I would have the better bishop against your knight. And I would be, I don't know, maybe well on my way to victory. So after knight takes e4, queen takes d4 would regain the piece. And after queen takes d4, bishop d4 check, king h1 and b6. Black would have the advantage. Um, nothing decisive yet, I suppose, but this is the kind of position that could very gradually grow into a decisive uh, advantage, especially if you're on the defensive here. Uh, note that the bishop is better in these positions because the knight does not have a support point. And now we uh, come to the point I made earlier. In this position, the knight on c3 is also in danger, as we will see in some variations. And that is all because of the fact that earlier white played b2, b3. Now, of course, this b2, b3 move would not be a problem had he not played c5 in this position. Because it is only this move, c5, this mistake, that under the given circumstances passes the advantage to black. So back to the game, knight takes d4, bishop d4, and knight e4. So this is the big shocker. So we looked at f takes e4, right? Now that led to a black advantage. Uh, also, Ivan Duke could have tried knight takes e4. But this does not win the black knight on e4. No, it rather exchanges the knight, because... Uh, in this case, white is taking the knight with his own knight. So after d takes e4, material count is even. But again, the bishop on d4 is pinned and will be lost. And with it, the game. So in the game, after knight e4, I'm sure Ivanchuk was um, feeling that again he was sitting on the wrong side of the board. And boy, has he been sitting on the wrong side of the board this tournament. Um... Yeah, he made a, uh, a, well, I mean, I don't want to be too hard on him because he's a grandmaster and who am I, but he made a number of bad mistakes, losing, I think, already three games or so and just drawing one. And also his previous uh, tournament was not at all good. Um, I think it was in Nalchik, did he participate there? I think he finished uh, at the bottom somewhere of the table. Okay, well, he tries to defend, and he plays queen e3 here. And um, this contains the damage. Let's have a look at the position. Material count is still even, but now black can snatch off a pawn. And he could have done so by means of bishop takes d4. Queen takes d4 and knight c5. But Shirov um, preferred to changed the move order a little bit and after queen e3 he played knight takes e5 and now of course this threatens knight e6 and knight e6 would take control of the d4 square and if black can take control of the d4 square then he can really set his extra pawn his free pawn the d file in motion and then he will be well on his way to victory this is also the kind of uh, strategy that Kramnik used in his fourth match game, if I remember well, when he was playing black against Anand. So maybe you guys want to check that out. There was also a struggle for the d4 square. And the question was, um, is black going to be able to uh, push his isolated d-pawn from d5 to d4, thereby uh, resolve it and uh, reach uh, an equal game? Okay, so she have played knight takes c5, and uh, of course, well, he has an extra pawn, so he has the advantage. But for the moment, white is blocking and uh, therefore holding on. But now, Ivanchuk made another mistake. Um, he could have played bishop c5, which would be bad. This would take the knight, but d5, d4 would regain the piece, and after queen e2 and d takes c3, this would give the extra black pawn an immediate super career, so this was not to be preferred. Um, but 
Ivanjuk didn't play this after knight takes c5. Um, he played rook c d1. And this again fails uh, the knight on c3. I think, to my mind, it was necessary to play bishop takes g7, clearing the way for the white queen all the way to the unprotected pawn on a7, because after king takes g7, white can again try to block um, the d5 pawn and try to attack it also. And now, for instance, after king g8, rook fd1 would be possible. Note that rook cd1 would not be good, because again it would uh, leave the knight lonely on c3, which becomes apparent after knight e6. And now, of course, queen takes a7 loses that knight. So knight e6, queen takes d5, but now black has the beautiful queen c7 hitting the queen and again that knight and now if for instance queen c4 trying to save the queen and the knight then of course queen b6 check uh, discovers the attack from the rook against the queen so therefore after bishop g7 king g7 queen g4 check king g8 rook f d1 would be better because this uh, keeps an eye on the knight on uh, c3 and then for instance knight e6 and queen takes a7 and white is still kicking again here uh, queen takes d5 would be wrong because of queen c7 and now uh, you think well the knight on c3 is protected right yeah so but after queen e4 rook takes d1 black lures away the protection from that knight because of the rook takes d1 again black can take it. So uh, rook fd1 keeping the knight protected so that he will be able to play queen a7 in this line. So I think that bishop g7 was the best move in this position. But after knight takes c5 as mentioned Ivanchuk played knight c d1 and now his position really is becoming very critical. But Shirov still needs to show some very fine technique but he's very much up to the task. He first plays bishop takes d4, luring the queen or the rook to uh, the d4 square. And if Ivanchuk were to play queen takes d4, then knight e6, queen e5, d4, and black is very close to winning already. So in the game, uh, Ivanchuk decided to play rook takes d4. And uh, since the queen is in front of the battery, the battery that is protecting the d5 pawn, Ivanchuk is for the moment even threatening to take this pawn on d5. But now uh, Shirov plays a very good technical move. He plays queen c6, safeguarding the extra pawn and again preparing knight e6 with uh, control over d4 when he could start moving his free pawn. So Knight e2 was played, desperately trying to keep the blockade on d4, but knight e6 is played after all. And after rook d2, Ivanchuk may have thought, well, if he pushes his pawn, I'm controlling the d4 square three times, so maybe I can snatch it off. So, what's he going to do? Maybe next I will place my knight on d4. And again, the pawn is on d5, it hasn't moved any further, and maybe I can defend the position. But hey, you're dealing with Shirov here, a master tactician and a very strong calculator. He plays d4 anyway. Now, why is it possible? Just for the simple fact that white's pieces are not coordinated. And um, sometimes, okay, it makes even sense to sacrifice your past pawn, uh, to stir up some trouble in your opponent's camp. Because now, after uh, queen f2, d3, white would uh, suffer a certain death, of course. So after d4, Ivanchuk says, okay, show me. I will take the pawn and just you show me now that you can push me over the edge. I've retrieved 
um, the pawn material is even and okay I know I don't feel well and I'm sure you calculated and I think I already see what you're going to do but just let's play a few more moves show me Queen b6 of course this attacks the knight for the third time and really puts the finger on the source pot because let's look at this diagonal here there are three white pieces on this diagonal and black is attacking all of them it's very important also of course to note that the queen on e3 is unprotected and that the knight on d4 is pinned because the queen behind it is uh, unprotected now you could think okay well maybe i can just try knight f3 but then of course queen takes e3 check knight takes e3 and rook takes d2 simply wins a rook for black so after queen b6 uh, Ivanchuk tried to reinforce his knight on d4 by means of rook f d1 but now the coup de grace Shirov played the ice cold rook d5 white's pieces are going nowhere of course black's next move is rook d8 intensifying the pressure on d4 when he would be attacking d4 fourfold and white would only be protecting it threefold now so in this position Ivanchuk realized what was going on and he resigned the game very nice technique by Shirov but I think it's very useful to see exactly why he resigned in the end for instance he could have tried knight f5 but then the simple rook takes f5 um, leaves black with a piece up so uh, let's have a look at knight c2 then well then rook takes d2 would be winning and now after queen takes b6 black has the intermediate check rook takes d1 after which he will recapture on b6 and b2 rooks up so after rook d2 it would be best to just recapture that rook but now black removes the defender from the queen on e3 again with rook takes c2 and uh, if now rook takes c2 then of course queen takes e3 so queen b6 but the in-between check on c1 safeguarding the rook and after king f2 and a takes b6 black is a piece up so this is the real explanation why Ivan Duke resigned uh, after the beautiful rook d5 and uh, with that we come to the end of yet another chess news video well it's late I'm getting a little bit tired my English is um, not improving so I hope you've enjoyed watching this video maybe learned something uh, from it thanks for watching and please until next time bye bye